Good morning and afternoon and evening, everyone, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to the Natural Capital Conversation session for today, September 7th. I'm Mary Ruckelshaus, and I'm the Managing Director of NatCap, and we welcome you. We have a wonderful group of speakers today and a moderator, Steve Pulaski, that I'm going to quickly turn over to you, but I'm going to give you a really brief um, intro to uh, NatCap, the Natural Capital Project um, first, and then a few logistics. So we are a partnership, NatCap is a partnership, and our aim is here, it's to pioneer science, technology, and partnerships like those with you all that allow people and nature to thrive. And we have a host of core partners shown here at the bottom, including the Chinese Academy of Sciences Institute on the Environment at University of Minnesota and the Stockholm Resilience Center, and then the Nature Conservancy and World Wildlife Fund. We also have a large network um, that includes many of you on this call. And our whole aim is to do new science that serves changes in policy and finance decisions. And you'll hear some of that today. So the speakers I'll let Steve introduce, but it's a wonderful group representing this network of networks that's been formed, that's really helping meet the need for, of urgent, urgent science needs for meeting this sustainable development goals. So bringing together networks of modelers in global trade and economics, that's GTAP that Tom here has um, founded. Then NatCap, our network is here, Biodiversity and Ecosystem Service Change Modeling, and then a, a bunch of key hydrology, land use change, and economics networks from around the world. So it'll be exciting to hear Kathy's framing of this as well for how does this new science linking these big models um, really start to inform new sorts of decisions. Okay, so just a few nuts and bolts and then over to Steve. So we will be recording this webinar and it'll be available on our YouTube channel. And we can also share a copy of the slides um, included with that um, after you, um, after the webinar. And then just one detail, if you have questions for the panelists, which we really encourage, please put those in the question and answer box. And then if you have technical problems or anything else that you really just need help with, that goes in the chat box. So there's two different places for you to communicate with us. And then finally, this conversation series that we're part of today is part of a larger one that NatCap has been hosting for a little over a year now. And they're really designed to spark great discussions and follow up. So we hope you'll do that engage today with the speakers. And the next one coming up will be on urban nature and how that can provide solutions for people and biodiversity in nature. Okay, thank you very much for listening to this overview and Steve, it's all yours. Okay, uh, Mary, you got us off to a really prompt start even before noon or before 10 a.m. your time. <laughs> Uh, so it's just it's just noon now. We're getting um, I'm, I'm looking at the participant list and it's 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 bouncing up. So I don't know if you want to repeat anything that you said uh, to a wider audience than when you started, but um, I think maybe we can we can just go on. If you have and, questions for speakers, please go in the Q and A. And if you have technical difficulties, put those in the chat. Those are probably the bottom line. Everything else, Steve, and the speakers will teach us. Thanks. Okay, so uh, my name is Steve Pulaski. I'm based at the University of Minnesota. I've been with NatCap for, uh, since the beginning. Um, and it's a real pleasure today to um, have, have this dialogue on the topic of bringing the value of nature into the economic mainstream. So I, I'm gonna spend just a moment kind of motivating this topic. Um, and then introduce uh, our three speakers, which I'm, I'm really glad uh, uh, that we have these three to, uh, to talk about this important topic. So if you're in a natural capital dialogue, um, you are uh, already aware that nature provides numerous benefits to people and essential life support. But the values of nature are often largely invisible in market economies. Uh, the quote that nature works for free. Um, 
But that means that there are inadequate incentives to maintain or enhance natural capital that, that, that is essential for providing the flows of these ecosystem services, these benefits to people. Um, we know from earlier work, so the, um, the IPBES work, uh, the global assessment, and earlier the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment showed that a majority of ecosystem services or nature's contributions to people are declining. And in particular, it is those benefits that are outside of the market system, what economists would call public goods, that have shown the greatest decline. Um, so today we're going to be uh, talking with uh, Tom Hurdall and Justin Johnson and, and Kathy about how to overcome some of these barriers and to, in fact, bring the value of nature um, into the economic mainstream. So I'll start, uh, I'm going to introduce all three speakers at the start and then we'll turn it over uh, to them. So Tom Hurdle is Distinguished Professor of Agricultural Economics at Purdue University. Tom is the founder and executive director of the Global Trade Analysis Project, or GTAP, um, which has created the leading global general equilibrium economic model of production, consumption, and trade that is necessary for understanding sustainability challenges. So Tom has pioneered linking these uh, economic models with natural science models to understand the impacts of economic activity on climate change, land use, biodiversity, conservation, pollution, and water quality, and to understand the impacts of environmental change on things in the economy, trade, income, GDP, and so forth. Um, Tom is also the lead PI for GlassNet, which is a um, global local analysis of system sustainability uh, network, an NSF-funded network of networks, of which both GTAP and NatCap are part of. And it's been a real pleasure working with Tom uh, on this and other projects over the last couple of years. Our second speaker is, is Justin Johnson, who is an assistant professor of applied economics uh, at the University of Minnesota. Um, prior to joining the faculty here, Justin worked uh, at NatCap uh, for a number of years where he worked on a wide range of issues, including global mapping of ecosystem services and linking ecosystem service models with computable general equilibrium models. Um, he is the lead author of a recent report uh, published just a couple of months ago in July by the World Bank entitled Making the Economic Case for Nature. So really integrating um, our ecosystem service models and these uh, economic models. And then third is uh, Kathy Kling. Uh, Kathy is the Tisch University Professor and Faculty Director of the David R. Atkinson Center uh, for Sustainable Futures um, at Cornell University. She is past director of the Center for Agricultural and Research, uh, excuse me, Rural Development at Iowa State University, uh, where she also held the President's Chair in Environmental Economics. Uh, Kathy is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, and her research focuses on economic valuation of ecosystem services and integrating um, integrated assessment model for water quality modeling. Um, and uh, I am sure Kathy will provide some uh, uh, framework for the kind of nuts and bolts that we're going to go through uh, on linking GTAP and, and INVEST and uh, other ways of, of, of getting on specific. So without further ado, Tom, I'm going to turn it over to you. And thanks very much for being here, all of you. OK. Um, I'm assuming you can see this OK, Steve? I'm yes, I can. <laughs> Visually and audially. Great. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Steve. Thanks for bringing this group together. I'm really excited to engage more with the NatCap community. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about linking markets, trade, and the macroeconomy to ecosystem services. And that's kind of a, a prelude to Justin's uh, presentation. So this is kind of by way of background to make his job easier. And rather than start out immediately jumping into the GTAP deep water, I thought I would start out with a model which is essentially one sector taken out of GTAP, a partial equilibrium model, which we're able to um, implement at a fine scale. And we'll talk a little about some classic e ecological problems, including excess nutrients um, from agriculture and groundwater sustainability challenges. 
I'll then get into the GTAP framework and I'll illustrate that with some analysis of human heat stress and labor markets, something we've been talking about quite a bit recently. And then um, finally, I, I want to talk, I know Justin was saying you all are very interested in distributional impacts. So I want to talk briefly about poverty impacts and um, of, of the heat stress example. So I'll be using in the partial equilibrium context, I'll be using a model called SIMPLE, a simplified international model of prices, agricultural prices, land use, and the environment. This was originally developed for teaching purposes. Keep things simple so you could um, quick, you know, teach this to a broad range of people across many disciplines. Well, we found out every time we taught this, two or three journal articles emerged and were well received in the interdisciplinary literature. And we realized this is also a research tool. In fact, because we're keeping the economics simple, there's great possibility, a great opportunity for robust transdisciplinary collaboration. So after a while, we realized aggregating all of the great stuff that people like, like those in the NatCap community do up to the, to, the, to the region or country level before putting it into simple was kind of ridiculous. And because the, the economics um, um, in, in simple are relatively simple, we could put those right down on the grid cell level. So simple G is simple, covering the globe and then zooming in to one region or another at the five arc minute level. And I'll show you examples for the US. So there's now simple G US, several versions of that, simple G China, simple G Brazil is underway. And there's a global simple G where the world as a whole is on a grid. So once we get down to the grid cell level, there's so many nice opportunities to interact as you'll see, interact with ecologists and others. So this first example, I'm gonna focus on the um, uh, the Mississippi Basin, the problem of excess nutrients flowing into the Gulf of Mexico, um, partly in deference to Kathy Kling, who's worked on this for a long, long time. I'm sure she'll have, um, it'll prompt some thoughts on her part. Um, but to do this, um, because the leaching characteristics of irrigated and rain-fed land are quite different, we need to break up within each grid cell. There's the irrigated crop and the rain-fed crop. And uh, we need to know about nitrogen application rates. That Information is not perfect, as you can see from the, uh, some of the state boundaries in there, but that's the best we have currently. And so we want to investigate alternatives for coming closer to the hypoxia task force goal you see in the lower right, and we're way above that now. So in order to analyze this, we need to build in key agroecological relationships, not all of them, but the ones that are key to this problem. So the first of these is just as you apply more nitrogen fertilizer, how much of a yield boost do you get? So we looked at Chris Kucharik, um, head of agronomy, uh, agroecology at the University of Wisconsin, and he ran the agribus model many, many times. It's an agroecology model. We were able to map out this curve. In fact, it was the insight of Naveen Raman Kuddy, who you see there, um, who, told, who said, well, you know what you need are transfer functions. That's what we use in ecology for this transfer function. So, he fitted the Gompertz curve for yield and the all important nitrogen loss relationship, the quadratic function with the opposite kind of curvature uh, to represent um, the implications of adding more nitrogen. So as you move out, you can see the benefit to yields is small. The increase in nitrogen is great. And that's why people like Kathy often advocate for taxing nitrogen to reduce its use. How do you put this in an economic model? Well, you've got to be a little bit clever here and find the right, um, the right relationship. So we have on the left the Gompertz functions, and you can see they vary depending on where you are in this grid world, depending on whether it's irrigated or rain-fed production. Uh, so you have these Gompertz curves, and it turns out what we really care about, what economists really care about, is the curvature of these and where you lie on this curve. So the right-hand side, you can see the formula for the economic parameter that matters here, namely the elasticity of substitution between nitrogen and land. So as you cut back on nitrogen, how much yield do you lose? And that formula is there and it's derived based on these fitted functions. So you can see a map of these and they vary quite a bit depending on where you are uh, in the US and of course, and whether it's rain fed or irrigated production. So that heterogeneity of the grid cell becomes important when we look at policies later on. So the policy I, I'm talking, I'm uh, illustrating here is a leaching charge. So you're polluting, you should be charged 
um, for the externality that you're imposing on the environment. And um, so a leaching charge leads to reductions in, in applications, but not as, um, <clears throat> but the loss in yield for a big reduction in N is much less than the reduction in, nit in nitrate leaching. So you can see that for this particular leaching charge, output goes down by about 2%. So prices go up, food prices go up, nitrogen use falls, leaching falls even more. So, um, so there's a pretty strong re uh, reduction in, in leaching, as you can see, and it's mapped out there and varies quite a bit depending on location. The most effective policy in this paper that Jing Lu is about to submit, uh, perhaps it's already submitted, multi-scale analysis of nitrogen loss mitigation in the Corn Belt, explores a variety of policies, not just leaching charges, because um, it's unlikely politically that those will be implemented. More likely are strategies to improve nutrient management, controlled drainage or wetland restoration. And you can see, depending on where you are in, in this Mississippi River Basin, depending on the local characteristics of that, the biophysical characteristics, as well as these economic characteristics, the most effective policy varies. It varies across the landscape. So this is a good reason why we should be doing this economic analysis at a fine scale. So that's um, single sector partial equilibrium first cut. I just want to illustrate another one briefly with two slides because it has some very interesting spillover effects. So this is um, based on a couple of papers led by Iman Hakigi. And um, here he's looking at um, groundwater sustainability restrictions. So what if we restricted, um, as, as, as all, probably all of you know, um, there are dramatic drown, drawdowns in groundwater um, in the West and in some places, annual withdrawals are 10 times recharge. So these water table was just dropping. It's not sustainable. What if you restricted them to recharge levels? You can't, can't take more than annual recharge. Well, there's a significant reallocation of production from those irrigated areas to other places in, in the same kind of farm resource region. The green here is what's called the fruitful rim um, reallocation to other parts of the country. Um, there's also reallocation overseas. This is a, slight, a different paper, slightly different experiment, but the same concept of um, restricting groundwater withdrawals. And in this case, you can see when you reduce production in places like the Central Valley, super productive, you need a lot more land elsewhere in the world um, to offset that. So the, the, we have these interactions with, through commodity markets that connect the grid cells, connect them at the region level, the national level, at the global level, they're connected. Because when you restrict production in one place, prices go up that's an incentive to expand elsewhere. So you have these market mediated spillovers that happen. Okay, now I want to turn to general equilibrium analysis. So now what we're gonna do is line up all the sectors in the economy. So simple G was just pulling out one sector and modeling that at fine scale. GTAP, we don't have the full economy wide accounts at the grid cell level, so we retreat to the national level, which is the level at which we have this full input output relationship, as well as the full bilateral trade relationships across sectors, across and sec uh, across economies in the world. And um, GTAP is the combination of all of those. And we'll look at heat stress in particular because that affects many sectors. So if the, the shock or the, the, the thing you're analyzing affects all the sectors in the economy, it doesn't, isn't very beneficial to just look at one because um, <clears throat> that the, often it's the relative, whether labor moves in or out of agriculture depends on what's happening elsewhere. So heat stress, just a word on heat stress. Um, here I'm leaning on collaborators in the Hoover lab here. Um, Jonathan and Shin have worked closely um, <clears throat> as, as PhD students with, with Matt Hoover and um, they have figured out cool ways of computing wet bulb globe temperature, which is the combined effect on the human body and our ability to dissipate internally generated energy based on temperature, humidity, solar radiation, manual labor, actually other conditions as well. So you can see, um, you, can, you can imagine that you've been out um, in a, a no doubt in places where it's been humid and hot 
the same time, it's really hard to cool down. And um, so working in that environment during the middle of the day, in, during any time during the day, even sometimes at night, can be very difficult. So we want to focus on that. Two sectors that are very hard hit are farming and construction, simply because they largely take place in unsheltered areas. These are just from an earlier set of calculations using an approximation to wet bulb globe temperature. Um, you see how um, this heat stress might vary um, across temperature and between the high and the low latitudes. So um, in the high latitudes, this is um, perhaps not such a severe problem, that, um, although it can still be an issue for people and on certain days as we, we've seen in the media. But where this is a huge, huge problem is the humid tropics. And there, of course, there's already been a lot of accommodation adjustment. People get up very early in the morning um, and um, take a siesta during the middle of the day, but still it's very stressful. And if it doesn't cool down at night, your body never really has a chance to adjust. And yes, you have the benefit of air conditioning. So the impact on workers is gonna vary depending on activity and exposure. So um, are you, uh, what sector are you working in? Is it agriculture or manufacturers? Is it services? Uh, what type of worker are you? Are you white collar or blue collar? That's gonna uh, determine also um, your exposure. How often are you exposed to the outdoors? Uh, that depends on your occupation in the sector and your work intensity. So we refer to the BLS, Bureau of Labor Statistics, for a mapping of these things. So for each sector, there are different types of labor and uh, the different types of labor are affected in different ways. So um, we put these together, plug them into GTAP. As I said, same structure as simple G. Um, and the only difference is that now all the sectors are, are connected. And um, I just put my timer here. Um, all the sectors are connected and um, we're tracking how much they sell to each other. So how connected are they both within the economy and how connected are they to other economies around the world through bilateral trade flows? So these are estimates of the national labor capacity losses um, in this work that's in prep, hope to be submitted soon. We're pretty confident in these labor capacity losses having iterated quite a few times with the latest greatest tool for calculating wet bulb globe temperature around the world at three hourly intervals over the whole duration of the, uh, the different models in the, in the um, uh, IPC6 uh, climate model ensemble. So that you can see the labor capacity losses range almost up to 10%. That is a huge loss. You're saying all of a sudden, <laughs> The people that are working there take away 10% of that. Um, in, and it's larger in some sectors. Pakistan, for example, very hard hit. But what sectors are here? This is a global perspective. Um, each sector at the global level is a box. And the size of the box determines its contribution to the global welfare loss from labor capacity losses. So you can see the biggest ones coming in agriculture. In agriculture, paddy rice dominates. Why? Because paddy's grown in humid environments. Paddy likes warm weather, paddy likes humid weather, but the workers don't. So uh, this is a problem. Um, you see uh, after that manufacturing because manufacturing is just a very big sector. Construction is disproportionately large here relative to services, the rest of services just because of its exposure. So national labor capacity losses translate into lower GDP, roughly in proportion to labor share in these economies as you've aggregated up across the world. So you can see the biggest GDP losses are now in, in West Africa, Nigeria, for example, where agriculture is a more important sector in the economy. So GDP losses, um, Average labor capacity loss on average across the economy is smaller in Nigeria than Pakistan. But when you um, aggregate up across sectors, um, in Nigeria is more severely affected. And that's all 3C warming. Everything I show you is 3C warming. Um, <clears throat> across the tropics, then, you have these intense effects um, on output, um, agriculture, construction. But 
you know, agricultural output, for example, might fall by five, six, seven percent. Why doesn't it fall more? It doesn't fall more because people still want to eat. So you still want to eat. It's more expensive to produce food. Prices go up and you can see a very strong price increase. So potentially from the food security side, much more um, severe effects in Nigeria, for example. Um, so it depends there on what economists call the price elasticity of demand. So you get this output contraction, a response on the part of consumers um, wanting still to have food, and that bids up the price and, and brings back some of the supply, but at much higher price. Who suffers from the higher price? Of course, it's the poor. The poor may spend up to 60, 70 percent of their of their budget on food um, at very low income level. I'll be talking about two dollars a day poverty, for example, in, in, in a few slides. So um, that um, a much bigger impact on the poor than the rich who might only spend five or 10 percent of their income on food. Um, there's economic geography to this. And because all the regions are connected, when you when your prices go up, you contract output of something. If you're Brazil or Argentina and you're exporting a lot of it, well, then other people share some of the pain. You export some of the cost of this. And um, if you're Venezuela and you're importing a lot of this stuff, um, it hurts because you're importing a lot of that pain. Um, so um, in terms of higher prices. So that's what we call the terms of trade. Terms of trade improve for some regions, decline for others. It's a wash globally, in terms of trade are. So just a few words about poverty as I uh, move to the end of the talk. Um, <clears throat> this is something I've thought about for a long time. In fact, that was before collaborating with you all, that was my thing, to work with household, um, <clears throat> household economists and look at poverty. And so uh, that was an earlier sabbatical of mine, um, this book, Poverty in the WTO. And, um, after commissioning a dozen or more studies and trying to figure out what they were doing, um, Alan Winters and I came up with a kind of a simple approach in the spirit of the simple model, perhaps, but now thinking about poverty, what's the, 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 way, the easiest way to understand what's going on? And for that, you want to look at the change in real factor returns. So this is wages, say, for unskilled labor and agriculture, deflated by the real cost of living for a given household. So you can see that um, <clears throat> agricultural unskilled wages are rising. Why? Because you've got to pull more agriculture into more, more labor into agriculture. Um, these returns fall in many other sectors. Why? Because the price of food is rising um, and they, they may have less labor to work with in some of those other sectors. So there are 10, 10 factors here and those are the ones determining the incidence, ultimately the poverty effects. These are the poverty effects. And so these map to different household types. There are seven strata here, agriculture, non-agricultural self-employed, urban labor, rural labor, transfer households. They may depend on government or foreign transfers, diversified households as well, urban and rural. So the gray bars show you um, where poverty, how much the percentage increase in national poverty at the $2 a day poverty line the World Bank uses. And uh, the bulb, the, um, the circles show you the, the effects across different strata. So there are very different effects depending on your composition of earnings, which is how we've differentiated households. So agricultural households are differentially affected from labor households, urban from rural and so on. Uh, the size of the circles just tells you how large that, uh, that population is in terms of the overall poverty in that country. So you can see a heterogeneous effect generally lift raising poverty, the exceptions are in cases where, for example, there's a, there's a large agricultural stratum, a uh, big part of the poverty and prices go up and ag unskilled wages go up. And um, at least not um, in a financial terms, they're better off, but maybe not in a health and a holistic perspective. So just wanna wrap up here. Um, I think there's a lot of scope for deeper collaboration between ecologists and economists. And, that's why um, Steve and Justin and I are so excited about this um, glass net effort. Um, Cross-scale analysis is important. The global drivers, more and more important, but you can see the local stresses and responses are quite heterogeneous. And, and from those come these market mediated spillovers. So that's why we like to think about global, local, global as our mantra. 
You want to choose the right economic model to fit the job. Um, sometimes it's partial equilibrium, high spatial detail. Sometimes it's general equilibrium. Sometimes it may be both. And um, just to, once more, there's a, there's a link here for GlassNet. It's been mentioned a number of times. It's our, uh, our hope to really strengthen these links between our community and yours. So thank you for the opportunity here. Great, thank you, Tom. And um, we'll, uh, we'll have questions. Uh, we, have, we have scheduled a half hour to uh, have questions and answers. So um, we'll save your questions, which we can either type into the question and answer, or when we get there, uh, raise your hand or chat and we'll do that. But for that, uh, I'd like to turn it over uh, to Justin Johnson. All right. Well, thank you, Steve, for the introduction earlier. And uh, thank you, Tom, very much for um, having laid a lot of the foundation in your talk for what I'll be hopefully uh, building on here. Uh, what I want to talk about is uh, mainstreaming ecosystem services into economics um, by linking the Global Trade Analysis Project with the GTAP model that Tom just talked about um, with our integrated valuation of ecosystem services and trade-offs invest toolkit put together here by the Natural Capital Project. But to motivate this talk, I wanna start off with what are the big questions that are important to answer and then might, we might be able to find new insights towards answering um, by linking these economic models with ecosystem service models. Um, the first one of that is just simply how much does nature benefit from the economy? Uh, but a very focused subset of this question is can we do that in measurable terms, um, in terms that finance ministers would understand, for instance. Um, well, accounting for whole economy impacts. The second question I'll talk about is who loses or maybe wins when nature is depleted. Uh, we, we must assess fairness and we must consider uh, economic activity that is hurt by the conservation actions we may be endorsing. This is, this is critical, I will argue. Uh, and then finally, the last question is what can we do about it? How can policy protect nature's value and equity? And so this transitions away from the question of just how much does nature matter? What's the big dollar value to, okay, it's important. What can we do about it? And economics, especially an economic model linked to an ecosystem service model, I think offers some very specific suggestions um, and analysis routes for how we can assess specific policies. But just backing up uh, in, in uh, one, for one moment here is I think many on this call would agree that there is a growing consensus that sustainability requires considering the entire bioeconomic system. And just in the history of this type of modeling, uh, we've traditionally really, I think, started off by looking at the interconnection between the economy and the biosphere by thinking about how the economy affects the environment. And so that's human impact. And uh, the classic example is uh, land use change or deforestation. But really, uh, the consensus that I think that is emerging is we need to broaden our perspective from just what is the impact to also what is the foregone value uh, that the biosphere then would feed back to the economy. And this is uh, I think a common understanding among many on this call that ecosystem services are one way that the biosphere uh, provides valuable services to humans, such as providing clean water and filtering out, filtering out nutrients. And then the context that we're in today, I think more specific to this call, is talking about a, a new model um, that links GTAP and INVEST, uh, cleverly named at the moment GTAP INVEST, um, that links the, the, this very frequently used economic model that has really become kind of the common language among people who do analysis of you know, trade policy or land use change policy or things like this. How can we link that to INVEST? But just a shout out for us to this is that, you know, really, this is, this is newly possible. It's exciting. Um, we are now relatively recently able to calculate a high resolution, you know, the resolution that's necessary um, for uh, ecosystem service analysis at a global scale. And so the first uh, study that showed this, I was um, uh, Chaplain Kramer et al. 2019 put into science. Um, and since then, we've been able to build on this. And that's, that's exciting because uh, now that we can calculate some of these things globally, we can connect them to global economic models. And so GTAP Invest is built on this and we've 
currently uh, included these five ecosystem services, uh, pollination, coastal protection, water yield, carbon storage, and marine fisheries, and map them to inputs into the GTAP model. Um, and this is going to be something that uh, continues to expand in detail, but these are the specific linkages that we have um, currently pulled in. And, you know, so some of these I think are pretty straightforward, such as uh, pollination, reducing the amount of wild pollinator habitat, reduces the amount of pollination services that happen um, on uh, cropland. And we can model how does that lower agricultural productivity of pollination dependent crops using very detailed high resolution information. Without diving too far in though, I want instead to focus on this, not so much on the methods, but on what are the answers to those questions that we can uh, start to have a bit more insight into uh, using these methods. So that first question is how much does nature benefit the economy? And this really was the first engagements that we had um, linking earth and economy models. And it was uh, with uh, collaboration with a NAFCAP partner, the World Wildlife Fund. And they commissioned us to answer the question of how much does nature matter? Um, another way of thinking about this is that bottom part of the linkage for how the biosphere feeds value back to the economy, could we put a dollar value on that? Now, of course, we recognize that GDP is a very imperfect measurement, um, but still it can be a very persuasive measurement. And so we wanted to see if we can connect an economic model and uh, an environmental model and uh, have a way of calculating GDP, what would that be? And so we put out uh, a couple of reports under the Global Futures moniker, and we analyzed two basic scenarios, um, a business as usual one, uh, what would happen if we projected current trends forward on uh, things like um, land use change or greenhouse gas emissions? But then we also created a scenario uh, that modeled global conservation um, or a success story of what happens if we have much more sustainable consumption, stabilization of land use change, um, and meeting uh, Paris-like agreements on climate change. And so just to give you a flavor of what the model looks like, um, for each of those two scenarios, we have a different land use map, which at a global scale, of course, you can't see much, but this is the basic input into INVEST, is these 300 meter, in this case, gridded maps that, that show an actual landscape. Um, and from that, we then calculate, uh, in this case here, the pollination value under the two different scenarios. And so, uh, an important thing to note here is both of these scenarios meet a many other goals like food security, they produce enough, prices have changed to reflect the fact that people do want to eat, as Tom said. Uh, and what we find here is um, given the land use change that results from this, what are the different amounts of pollination services that are, are given to the economy? When we reduce natural habitat, where does this cause a reduction in value? But the answer to that question then is first towards what WWF wanted us to assess was, does nature matter? Well, yes, uh, following the global conservation scenario avoided about 10 trillion in losses by 2050 compared to business as usual. And throughout, I wanna note this is an extremely conservative estimate uh, because we only were modeling a very small subset of ecosystem services and consistently chose the, just the, the tightest claim that we could assess for which there was strong evidence. But a second um, message came out of this is that not just that the difference between business as usual on the left and global conservation on the right here, uh, not only was that difference big, um, is we found that the difference was biggest for low income and to a lesser extent low middle income countries. And this can be seen here that the change of a, a large loss under business as usual um, that, uh, that is felt by the low income countries here in the red bar, the change upwards had the greatest percentage increase in these countries. So not only do low income countries re, uh, depend the most on nature, they also benefit the most from policies, in this case, just our global conservation policy um, that are aimed at protecting ecosystem services. So that basic finding um, led to a second question um, which is who loses or wins when nature is depleted. We started to see that there in the, um, in the fact that low-income countries uh, benefit the most. 
And this led to a very fun engagement. Um, many of you may be aware of uh, the Dasgupta Review. It's a landmark study showing how our economies rely on nature. It's an excellent synthesis of what we know. Um, a shout out to uh, a net capper, Emily McKenzie, who was critical in that effort. And one of the key messages is that nature is especially important to low income individuals. Uh, and so we had a fun opportunity uh, to provide evidence into that report. We were commissioned to run our GTAP invest model to assess very concretely how do different countries or even different parts of the economy gain or lose natural value under different scenarios or policies. And so this was included uh, directly in the uh, Dasgupta review, um, uh, buried into box 14.3. Um, but just to show you what those results say, um, this is the same image, but just with a bit more detail, um, is that uh, not only do ecosystem services matter most for the poorest countries, um, they also matter especially more when we cross tipping points. This is one of the key things that the Dasgupta review wanted to assess is not just what's a small change uh, on the economy uh, or uh, on the environment have uh, on economic performance, but what if we cross some sort of tipping point? I won't get into the details of that, but we see that um, uh, differentiating by income group, um, crossing tipping points in forestry, pollination, and fisheries um, resulted in uh, in aggregate, very large values, 2.7 trillion GDP lost per year. Um, but we see that it is a much bigger loss for the low income countries on the left of the left side here. Uh, this is particularly true then in Sub Saharan Africa and South Asia. Um, another just important note here that I want to keep making is this again is a highly conservative estimate um, for many reasons, including here, we did not include climate change. Our goal was just to assess what is the loss from uh, biodiversity and ecosystem services, excluding climate change. And so that leads to the last question, um, is how can policy protect nature's value and also the equity that we have in it? Um, here, we engaged with the World Bank to assess how specific policies could mitigate these losses from ecosystem services. Um, and it started out by engaging in discussions to identify what are those policies that on a day-to-day -day level that organizations like the World Bank would be thinking about. Um, one of our first findings is as we started to enumerate those is they could be uh, modifications in all the, the any different part of this interaction between the economy and the biosphere. And so that led to us needing to um, improve our models for them to be able to incorporate the different things that uh, they might change. And in particular, I promised I wouldn't have any methods in this talk, but I failed. Um, and the particular method we I'll talk about is we did realize we really had to endogenize, endogenize the relationship between changing prices and economic activity and how does land use change, things like agricultural expansion or pasture land expansion, um, how can that be included in the model endogenously? In the being NAPCAP, we um, defined these curves, which captures that, um, which reflects the natural land converted on the horizontal axis and the land rental rate. Um, specific for different geographic regions based on high resolution data. And so that's another paper that we'll be having coming out on that, but it shows yet another linkage between these different scales. So what this, um, with that methodological piece in place, we could then um, define different nature smart policies. Uh, there's much information here, but it I think can be summarized down into repurposing agricultural subsidies in different ways. Uh, coming up with payments for ecosystem service programs. We're thinking about where we can invest in research and development to increase ag yield and thereby reduce expansion of ag into natural lands. Uh, we also combined all of these different policies into different packages. And what we found, um, these different combinations of policies is shown here. Um, it shows two aspects of performance not on the horizontal axis, the avoided natural land conversion percent um, when we implement these policies. And then what is the change in real GDP relative to a business as usual under that policy? And so we see um, removing subsidies is here in, in uh, black. Uh, P2 is a local uh, PES, uh, Payments for Ecosystem Service Program. And then the blue one is a global one. And so we see that there are indeed win-wins. It goes up in both GDP and uh, natural land that is conserved. 
Um, and not surprisingly, when we layer in additional things and uh, put in all the policies together, we see the greatest performance um, in the combined scenario. An important thing to note is that uh, when we consider this, especially when we consider research in development um, benefits, um, this is something that uh, again reiterates this message that investment in ecosystem services and the things that protect ecosystem services is most important for low income countries. Um, we see that here on the left is the policies with uh, that are excluding research and development and we see the benefit in light blue to low income and middle income countries is larger. And it, when we shift upwards uh, over here by including research and development that gap persists and we see that the low income countries have the greatest to gain by um, taking on that policy package. I'll end with one last bonus policy very, very briefly. Um, and this is representing where we're hoping to go soon is um, what is the cost of achieving 30 by 30, which is one of the many ambitious land protection targets that has come out. And what was uh, very nice about endogenizing land use change is we can now also assess these large policies that may uh, reduce the amount of land available to the economy. Um, we did this by assessing where is there conflict between agriculture and uh, our definition of the um, gridded goal of uh, you know, where you would protect to meet your 30 by 30 commitment. Um, and this was something that then shifted our land supply curve um, uh, and built on our ability to endogenize these effects. The takeaway that I want to leave you with is that um, it turns out the cost of achieving 30 by 30 in this modeling framework um, we see is something that comes to almost uh, exact uh, compensation for the loss in ecosystem service value under business as usual. So in other words, um, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. So protecting ecosystem services has a gain to the economy, but then taking land out to meet a 30 by 30 goal has a cost, which is roughly the same size as the benefit we had in the previous studies I mentioned. Uh, but when we start to dig into this uh, in specific countries, specific regions, we see that it is not neutral across the globe. It's low income countries that have, yes, the greatest gain uh, from protecting ecosystem services, but they also have the biggest shift leftwards here of costs incurred by protecting that land. And it is not neutral for them, it's very costly. And so that's the message I wanna end with is th thinking about the equity considerations for these costly policies meeting 30 by 30 goals is something I think we need to think about quite a bit. So with that, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk. And I think I'll pass it to Steve to uh, go to our, our, our next uh, person talking. Great, thank you, Justin. Um, and again, um, uh, if you have questions, uh, feel free to uh, type them in the Q and A, and and we'll also take questions live um, after our third speaker, which is uh, Kathy Kling. So, Kathy, over to you. I'm queuing myself up here. Uh, um. Welcome uh, to Ithaca <laughs> and my office at Cornell. Uh, I, um, uh, let's see, is this, it doesn't seem to want to be full screen. Um, so I'm, I'm really pleased to be here and be part of this. Um, I view myself as uh, somebody to kind of uh, raise some discussion, um, comment briefly and, 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 um, and basically be a major cheerleader for much of what we've heard in these previous two conversations. So um, I, I was tasked with the, the question of discussion of the role of economics in bringing the value of nature into policy. Um, in doing that, I thought about what, I, what again, what I wanna do is, is contribute to the conversation, do it briefly, and then let uh, everybody have lots of chance to, to weigh in. And I decided to try to do this in three ways. First, I'm gonna start with a theme. Um, and and I, uh, my theme is gonna be, um, do we need to, should we talk, be talking more about changing the framing and the conversation that we have about economics and the value of nature? And I'll talk about that in a minute. And then I have three topics that I think are more directly related to my charge. One, I'm gonna talk about the role of economics in shaping environmental policy in the US context. 
I'm going to talk about uh, moving away from GDP as our single and only metric. And uh, then I'm going to riff on some things that I think economists can and should do in order to move on those agendas. Okay, the, the, this theme um, that, I, that I wanted to share to get discussion on. So we all read, have read for years and years, uh, newspapers, we've taken economics classes, and we see a daily deluge of reporting of economic statistics. We see quarterly GDP, we see world GDP, we see jobs reports, we play inflation reports, so on and so forth. And most readers um, presume, I'm going to argue, that that's because those things are incredibly important for human well-being. Um, basically, if this is what's always being reported on the nightly news, I think the implicit and, and often explicit message is that, therefore, is what economists think most matter for us to pay attention to. And consequently, anything that makes those indicators worse off are bad for us. Uh, we can't do such and such because it will hurt the economy are the kinds of arguments we often hear. I think that economists might do better, or I wonder if we should not change our conversation to think about different messages. Um, I've thrown in here an alternative statistics and headlines topics. Suppose instead of GDP metrics every quarter, we had quarterly change in the stock of our natural capital. If we had worldwide changes in the stock of our natural capital, if we had green GDP estimates that included many of the type of ecosystem services that we heard about in the last um, presentation that, that Justin did so, so carefully, what if we were regularly pummeled with Lorenz curves describing the state of distributional equity, um, uh, ecosystem service values, and so on, would then the implicit message be, wow, economists are telling us it isn't just market activity, but it's the quality of life and metrics associated with the quality of life that matter. Actions that make those indicators worse are therefore bad for us. And Instead of saying we can't do something because it will hurt a GDP or some other indicator, maybe the message would then become, if we don't do this, the quality of life in this country and elsewhere will decline. I've been really intrigued by the fact that we, in my lifetime, have changed the framing and conversations in some important areas. When I was a kid, Smoking um, cigarettes in public areas was presumed to be the norm. Um, you'd have gotten punched in the face if you'd have asked someone not to. Um, now that whole notion is completely flipped on its head, at least in the US and, and some other parts of the country. We have changed the notion of what is, um, what is acceptable and, um, and what we, we the, the, any conversation we might have about smoking is secondhand smoke causes all of these problems and that's why we don't have it. We've had a huge change in littering and the notion about the acceptability of littering. I'm not sure how those conversations and what data and or role economics had, if any, in making those changes. But I'd like to raise the question of whether that isn't something that we can and should be doing more. Can economists help reframe the conversation regarding the value of nature and the importance of preserving nature? I'm going to come back to that in each of my three sub bullets. So number one topic I wanted to talk about is the role of economics in U.S. environmental and federal policy. I'm gonna go through very quickly, and sorry, these are kind of ugly slides, but I have found that I, that I think there is a large part of the environmental and to some extent economics community that doesn't understand how really important values, um, benefits and costs, just like the ones we heard from both Tom in the studies that he provided and Justin on the, at the world scale, just how important those numbers are in changing regulation. How does that happen? In the 1980s, uh, Ronald Reagan was president. He, he issued the first executive order that said, 
regulatory action at the federal level shall not be undertaken unless the potential benefits to society from the regulation outweigh the costs. Benefits need to exceed costs. This notion applied to all major federal regulations, which uh, were over $100 million uh, in magnitude, which is the vast majority of them. Now, there are many cases where there are requirements in place in the, under legislation or statute that they can't make decisions based on this trade-off. Nonetheless, this started a, a complete change in the framing and the converse, conversation about, about what economics can and should do. Clinton uh, and Obama both continued that basic concept with some changes. Trump even continued it, although he tried to muck up with some other things that have now been undone. Importantly, under the Biden administration, there is now a major effort to modernize benefit cost analysis and, uh, and undertake regulatory reform in ways that not only focus on economic efficiency, it is not taking that away, benefits exceed costs, but also bring into play uh, environmental justice and distributional impacts. This stuff is important. It isn't just uh, in a bunch of, of buildings in Washington, DC. A really nice um, opinion piece was just published by Alm Gartland, just came out a month or so. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to read it. Uh, he explains what a vital role cost-benefit analysis is play, has played in U.S. policy. Al is essentially the chief economist at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And he describes how these roles, uh, these rules have in fact changed policies, that they have changed regulations. And he talks about the fact that most of that is done um, in federal offices during, before, and after uh, benefit cost is done and then displayed transparently to the public. Point again being that this matters, it changes. And he has a, a number of fascinating examples where they both in, tightened regulations because of the data ha they had, and in other cases, changed regulations to make them more cost effective. He also talks about a variety of problems. Um, I won't talk about those here and, and puts out a call for economists and others to help improve those problematic areas. He notes that economists need to reemphasize the efficiency role of benefit cost analysis, build awareness among decision makers that there are scientific underpinnings. But he also emphasizes as many, many economists do that while benefit costs analysis is critical for thinking about economic efficiency, do the total uh, winners, are they able to compensate losers? Is the value of the pie bigger than it was before? That is only one decision metric that should be used. It is very reasonable and appropriate to think about things like equity and to not muck those two things up together. Second, I want to talk a little bit about this idea of moving away from GDP uh, and incorporating more into it than simply market values. Let me start by saying that the report that Justin described and all the work with the economic value of nature and, and Nat Cap Glassnut is incredibly valuable. It is a huge contribution. What they're doing, as much as I can understand, in at least many of the examples I've seen so far, is correctly identify the effect on GDP and, else, uh, and, and other efficiency metrics of ignoring the value of ecosystem services. Pollinators, uh, we had free pollinators, those are worth things. And in fact, our, our GDP metrics would be lower without them. This is a huge and important start. It, it's really exciting. It's, it's, we're seeing them do this is, is what we've long needed. 
they are quick to note that there are many ecosystem services they're missing. That is not a criticism. They got it up and running, and now they're, they're looking to add, and that, that is fantastic. What I want to talk a little bit about is the issue or the, the questions about ecosystem services that have clear market impacts or footprints and including those communicating those and using those in decision making versus those that do not have market type impacts. Pollination services is an excellent example of one that does. It's, you, you, you can see impact on yield, you can see impact probably if you have, if you have to do less pollination, um, you save costs. There are many ecosystem services or that, that could potentially be very valuable that do not. This is well known in economics. We talk about these non-market uh, values. Biodiversity and cultural values are just two of them. Both of those very much belong in um, quality of life metrics, in economic welfare analysis is another way you could say it. But many people think about them a little bit differently. And I think they resonate a little bit differently to uh, policymakers. And I think we need to discuss that and have a framing for how we, um, how we talk about those things. So I, as I was listening to the incredible examples that Tom had, I was, I was thinking about his heat stress example. So I quick type this out. So if th th this isn't, uh, so forgive typos and errors in, in logic and thinking, but so what, what they've done here is amazing. Again, let me be very clear, taking a, using the GTAC framework to think about what's gonna happen to labor productivity around the world as heat um, stress increases, how that's gonna be differentially impacted, what that's gonna do to, it's, it's phenomenal, it's incredibly important. So being the, you know, it's easy to sit on the sidelines and critique, I'm like, okay, that's critical. But wait a minute, that misses stuff. This is health impacts. These workers are sick, maybe. Uh, maybe they have headaches. They take uh, Advil, they go to the doctor more, you get heat strokes and you, okay. Well, those are markety type things we can measure. Uh, some of that kind of stuff seems to me to clearly belong in a full accounting. But then I'm thinking, well, you know, go beyond that. There's also things that are truly not market. For example, how much would you be willing to pay not to feel rotten, not to have heat stress above and beyond what it would cost uh, to get some Advil and take some aspirin. All of those things belong in welfare estimates. That's a consumer surplus value. How much should you be willing to pay so your kids, I couldn't even finish the sentence, so your kids can uh, feel at full attention in their classes and not be stressed by heat. All of those pieces conceptually are very much part of values and welfare. And um, doing a better job of, of people like me that live in, the, in, in economics about, about talking about the fact that all of these things matter. Those that can be measured somewhat in markets and those that are purely outside market systems. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm running out of time, but this is basically my last slide. Uh, I started to make a list. It's very incomplete. What things can and, econ and should economists do? Well, we definitely need to work much harder on distributional impacts, metrics, measures, and the data to populate them at different levels. Again, Tom showed us some great uh, examples of, of the kinds of things that can be done. Um, we need to do a lot more of that. We need to focus on the kinds of questions that, that need answers, not just those that can be uh, answered with specific time series and panel data sets. And not only, I would argue, those that can be answered with um, non-controversial benefit approaches. So for example, here I'm thinking um, a huge literature in environmental economics has now built up on using hedonic values. How much do housing values change? How much do land values change as a response to some 
externality or um, public good. That is critically important work, but it misses a bunch of stuff. And that other stuff we need people working on too. Um, those hedonics, those kinds of uh, wage risk studies miss all the other benefits and values that cannot get incorporated. And basically, I think Tom and Justin just start to need to start making long lists of what they need economists to do and, and get us all to get our graduate students to do it. So with that, I will stop uh, and um, thank you very much for having me here today. Great, thank you, Kathy. And thanks to Tom and Justin earlier. So we, we now have a little bit shy of a half an hour um, uh, time for questions and answers. Um, I would encourage everybody to type in their um, question into the, the Q&A. You should see it on your, your Zoom uh, folder there. Um, and uh, so please, please type in, we've, we've got a number of questions there and I'm gonna start uh, with the ones that, that have come in. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to paraphrase them, but uh, if uh, the person who I am uh, saying this for wants to follow up and uh, clarify, or if I didn't get it quite right, uh, please do so. Anyway, the, the first question uh, is uh, from uh, Marcelo uh, Hernandez Blanco, and um, uh, he says, either a question for me or Justin. Justin, I'm going to turn it to you first. Um, uh, so thinking about ecosystem services, we, we oftentimes kind of give them a maximum quantity or quality of service that the system can provide. Could you please reflect on how to best assess the change in the value of ecosystem services related to some kind of change in ecosystem health, however you want to define that, but you know, some change in the, the quality or the quantity of services? Yeah, happy to start on that. Um, although I think Steve, you may have some ideas too. Um, but what I would say is you know, this is a, a really good question uh, you know, focused pretty much within the ecosystem services community of how do we deal with uh, continuous changes, I would say, um, rather than thinking about land is shifting from you know, being fully natural and giving the most ecosystem services to some sort of uh, degraded state where it offers no ecosystem services is have um, intermediate classes would be one way to do this um, where you have different management regimes um, modeled as different land use uh, land cover classes um, have this then you know result in different levels of ecosystem services which would then be tied into the economic model components I think a lot of work needs to be done on that point I think a lot of uh, existing ecosystem services have assumed either you know fully provided um, or not um, but uh, but I think it's a really good point and it also leads to some I think possible, you know, effective policies of how do we not just prevent land from being converted uh, from natural to say agriculture, but how do we do it in a way where the agricultural activity on it is, um, is not as damaging itself. And this again, it would be another one of those sort of intermediate cases that it's not the full provision of ecosystem services, but may well be critical to the answer. Since I was mentioned, I'll, I'll, I'll pile on top. Uh, thanks, Justin. That's, um, the, I, I think this is a great question because um, what, it, what it says is, you know, the world is actually shades of gray. It's not black and white. And as Justin just said, it's not like either all ag or, you know, pure nature. Um, so we can think about um, uh, alternative practices within agriculture that both modify the yields that you get as well as impact the water quality or the, the habitat value of this. And so I think our challenge, frankly, in the system services community is, is figuring out like how do we accurately model those, those shades of gray and how many of them can we actually incorporate into the analysis. And as Justin knows, this is a, you know, we, we can greatly expand the uh, complexity of the analysis because we're we're thinking about many many more um, uh, possibilities than that you know it's it's much simpler if you're just modeling black and white but of course you know a lot a lot of the interesting aspects of this as you pointed out uh, Marcelo really do come in this you know thinking about how do we you know how do we shift practices for example and 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 get some of the you know aspects of both you know food production as well as improvement in in biodiversity habitat and water quality and so forth. Okay, um, 
Marcel, please feel free to add in if we haven't uh, hit directly on your question. Um, and, but otherwise, I'll, I'll move on to the next question. OK, um, next question is uh, um, uh, from, from Rob. Um, and he asks about um, how can we incorporate, uh, this is Rob Griffin, are, are there gaps you see in incorporating marine and coastal ecosystems into this type of modeling? Uh, is that open to any of you all? Well, I could maybe start um, just because we have included that in one of the prior versions of, of GTAP Invest. Um, we looked at it from a very simplified uh, angle. Again, just looking at um, coastal protection value, we identified which grid cells, which kilometer segments of the coast go from not at risk to at risk uh, under different climate scenarios, as well as the different scenarios of where we lose uh, marine habitat. Uh, this then we uh, charted through how does this have an impact on the uh, GDP that is present um, once you spatialize it within a certain distance from the coast. This is really a blunt instrument. Um, and I, I think uh, better understanding the full complexity of the coastal uh, models that, that you're referencing, uh, Rob, um, I think is a key shortcoming at the moment. Um, and so I guess my answer to that also would be, you know, NetCap is a network and GlassNet is a network of networks. Um, and thinking about how we can engage with experts like you uh, who know about these things is sort of an immediate next step. Um, it's it's definitely building that network so that the experts on that topic can show us and tell us what is the right way to add detail there because this is definitely a, a shortcoming. Um, but maybe I'd even point to, you know, uh, Tom, you, you, you perhaps know about some of the um, work that your team has done thinking about sea level rise and uh, uh, how it impacts some of the CGEs and the integrated assessment models. That would be another angle that I, I could see um, having more work done. Um, did you want to comment or no? Okay. Okay. Um, our, our next question, a little bit uh, shifting gears, but but in a way, uh, a little bit of a, uh, of a theme with, with Rob and also with uh, Kathy's comments about, you know, thinking about other, you know, like what's left out. Um, so this is from uh, Badan uh, Orshkevich. I hope I didn't mispronounce it too badly. Um, but thinking about uh, some of the neuroscience research um, that's been done at Stanford and, 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 and closely related with uh, Natural Capital Project, and thinking about the mental health benefits um, to individuals, and are there ways to develop that measurement um, and, and get this actually connected with um, this kind of modeling and into the economic mainstream and healthcare services? I'll jump in if that's if that's okay. Um, Please. So, uh, and it, it it connects to to as you said, um, Steve Rob's Rob's question, um, and just just on in terms of Rob's question, I mean one of the one of the first steps is to figure out what are all the ecosystem services associated with marine and coastal areas, which ones are monetizable by you know storm protection and therefore less loss of property. And that that the sort of work that that's been done, but then there's a lot of other ones um, that relate to recreational use, walking on the beach, seeing a sunset, you know, all all, all that the sort of stuff. Um, and then in in terms of the the um, the mental health, uh, yeah, this this is really hard to come up with metrics, but completely and appropriate and correct to incorporate. And that's one of the things that it, it from as an economist. So what do I mean by that? When we think about weighing policies as an economist, we think about valuing things. And we don't just mean cups of coffee, pens, and shoes. We mean all things that people value. And people highly value their health. They highly value um, enjoyment, their recreation, um, and so conceptually, when we are making policy decisions using benefit cost analysis, we should be incorporating those, those as well as um, how much aspirin we don't have to spend money on because somebody has a headache. That said, it's of course 
hard to do. And um, I, I think as the research becomes more extensive, as we can begin to get better uh, sense of, of quantifying how to do it or good substitute metrics for it, rather than always trying to put everything into one, one frame. Um, but it's a great question. And I think um, it, it, the important thing I want you to know is conceptually as an economist, it absolutely is on the table with the same level of, of value as anything else. It's just harder to do, but that means it needs to be talked about by people like you over and over again. Um, and to keep reminding us that it is, it's real. And it's, it, it, it's about the quality of life. It's about, um, about our welfare. I'll just add, I mean, I, th this is a great question and it's one that we've been um, trying to deal with in the natural capital project, you know, really this, this link to um, mental health benefits. And, and as Kathy said, this is a, a extremely important component of, of quality of life. And I think there's challenges here, frankly, for both the kind of the, 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 the neuroscience community as well as the economist. I mean, you know, for us, for economists, translating this into um, something the finance minister will relate to is, is, is perhaps difficult. But as Kathy said, there's, a, there's certainly a conceptual framework here that, that fits. I think for the neuroscience community, you know, really showing what um, the change in nature that happens and then the, to the change in mental health. I think that's really challenging, um, as, as many on this call I, I know are, are familiar with. But, um, I think it's, as Kathy said, I think this is incredibly important. I think there is, um, you know, this may end up, you know, five, 10 years down the road being one of the more important areas of thinking about how does nature lead to benefits for us, but we're, 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 we are not as far along on that for sure as, as many other things. Tom or Justin, you like to, okay. I'm, I'm answering some things. I'm answering some things online, and um, <laughs> while you guys are going on that, and and when you're ready, I'll chime in on a few things. But um, keep going. Okay, Tom. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna have one more question, um, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna just to tee you up. I'm gonna turn it over to you for a minute for uh, for, for several of your responses, but. Um, there's a, a, an interesting question. It's, it's directed to Justin, but actually, Tom, I think uh, both you and Justin uh, should weigh in on this one. Uh, it's from Juliet Perch, uh, who says, is the data for ecosystem service valuation and the results from your GTAP invest model, are these precise enough to get information at the national and subnational level? Uh, this could be extremely useful for policy engagement at the national level, but I guess the question is, how good are we, right? How, how, how precise is this? Is it, is, it, is it ready for policy? The last bit of, is it ready for policy? I, that, I, Tom's the expert on answering that question. I'll just maybe offer the brief comment on um, how much information could we extract for specific uh, regions? Um, I mean, yes, in a sense but um, we do have high resolution ecosystem service results. And so any information that is based on that, uh, you definitely could extract information for you know, even very small subnational scales. The question though, is to what extent do the policies modeled or the economic factors included, uh, to what extent are those accurate enough for uh, national or subnational things? I think the short answer in my estimate, but I'm curious Tom's response are, um, if you accept and understand all of the input assumptions, um, they're pretty good at the national scale, although our model is not at the subnational scale. And so there will not be a whole lot of information uh, relevant at, at that factor. Um, but the last thing to say is that since coming out with some of this work at the global scale, one of the major sort of uh, new things that I think we realized we're gonna to need to focus on um, just based on who has reached out to us is uh, having much more detailed national representations. Uh, we currently have a you know, global GTAP model, all the, the, of the regions are included. Um, what if we wanted to zoom in on specific countries? And so I think that's a, a clear emerging thing that might do then a better job of um, having national or subnational uh, relevant outcomes. Yeah, um, I'll just um, join uh, Justin's excellent response. Um, um, 
generally when we valid tried to validate these economic models, which is not done nearly enough, but we find that the more we aggregate, the better they do. So <laughs> explaining things at the global level is a lot easier than at the country level. The country level is a lot easier than the region level. So right now we're really struggling with validation of the gridded model, what level at which it can be validated and um, where can we have confident predictions. So that's, that's where the science is on that right now. I think engagement with policy, it's a process, but um, seeing how much interest there was at the World Bank with the project that Justin led um, with the other, uh, with WWF before that, with the other NGOs and, and investors now, um, there's a lot of interest and the way this usually works is, um, is was the case in that World Bank project, uh, Justin and Uris, my colleague here at Purdue was working on that. They thought they'd kind of done the job. They delivered that to the folks in the World Bank and said, no, 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 that's not what policymakers care about. We care about this over here. And, it, and it's a back and forth, back and forth. And then they start delving into particular instances and saying, well, um, what do you mean about redirecting these, the spending from here to there? That's not, that's not what we mean. Um, we mean something else. So it takes, it's a process of iteration, but engagement is the first step. And I think that's great that there's, this is such a great opportunity um, for engagement along this, uh, along these lines. Tom, you mentioned previously that you, you were, you were commenting on other questions that have come sure. in. So I don't know if you want to uh, um, fill yeah. in on some other topics. Yeah. Uh, two things. One, um, Gretchen Daly asked, um, um, well, how predictable are these spillovers? So I was showing those spillover effects um, uh, from restricting groundwater uh, withdrawals in one part of the country, they spill over. How predictable are they? How much confidence do we have in those? And um, that's another way of asking that is, um, is really how well are we modeling those markets? Because um, it's really, you know, in economic terms, a question of kind of supply and demand elasticities. <laughs> and um, if supply is very responsive in places, that's one answer. If demand is very inelastic, that's another. So it comes down to getting those right at the right scale. And that's something we're working, wrestling with right now. I think qualitatively, we can say, yes, those exist, but just by, the, by what we observe, what we understand about basic economic logic. But um, the you know, predictability of those really depends on um, having a validated model, validated at the relevant scale. It goes back to the comment I made earlier. So I think we might be uh, confident that um, some of those spillovers will occur overseas and some domestically. Um, how much will move to which of the, the ag resource regions? That's something actually we're wrestling with right now. Uh, the other um, point that uh, came up, I, I guess it's a kind of a response to Kathy, just to say, um, um, yeah, so I, I like the way she's thinking. She's saying, okay, what's the next thing? The next thing is to engage with the public health folks because they know a lot about the, um, you know, the, you know, the costs, the medical costs and some other aspects of this. And indeed, they've already approached us. We're, we've got to get this one thing out the door before we go there. But I think that is the logical next step on the heat stress thing. Um, and then move to the non-market costs, which are obviously super important in this case. So um, I think from my experience, um, you know, building this kind of global analysis over the last few decades and you know, in the more of the trade policy space, um, it's all about incremental progress and it's all about mobilizing a large network. As Kathy says, she's got grad students, Steve has grad students. <laughs> we need to mobilize them, but also people around the world, the, the impacts are gonna be largest in the human tropics. We need people working, grad students working there, faculty and researchers. So I think it's all about um, <laughs> mobilizing this large community. Um, I know, from working with the GTAP over uh, community over several decades, there are 22,000 people in that network now. And the database that's issued every couple of years is hugely rich as a result. Every, every couple of years, whole, you know, many, many of the country databases are updated, scrutinized, peer reviewed. That's what it's gonna take 
in this space. We're going to need to build that community. We're going to need to find uh, develop a platform for them to share information, to replicate what others are doing, to critique it and extend it. Um, in one, one week from today, we'll be having another GlassNet workshop. Anyone interested in that, email me or go to the GlassNet um, webpage or something, but uh, we'll get you on that list. But that, that uh, workshop in a week is going to be on cyber infrastructure for collaboration in this way, for, for crowdsourcing this stuff. I think that's what we have to do. Great, thanks, Tom. Um, I have a question here uh, from uh, Yerban, and you have a very long second and last name, so I'll, I'll just uh, say with Nirvan. Um, he's saying putting the putting it or trying to put a value on nature sometimes is criticized from uh, in various outlets because there are so many frameworks and different values from different frameworks. So it's sort of a plea. It seems like maybe we're in the wild west phase of of this. You know. What should we be looking at? What's appropriate? What's uh, what's authentic or, or uh, credible? Well, I mean, yeah, I think first the response is that we, we kind of are in the wild west, uh, which is both a, a good thing. There's a lot of new territory to cover, but also a challenging thing is that there could be uh, many hard to explain forces and dangerous things to uh, find in, in, in the new town we go to. Um, I mean, I think some of the criticisms that I think are most relevant is overgeneralizing. Uh, we find results that are specific to the very detailed case that we spend a lot of time narrowing in on by uh, assumptions and um, being very careful about what we're trying to say. But I, I see often a, you know, a tendency for this to then get expanded beyond the very limited set of circumstances where we think it's relevant. Um, and I, I think that's been evident in some of the you know, earlier work in ecosystem services at, at global scales uh, too. Um, and so I think all of those things remain very, very relevant. Um, I guess just ever being vigilant when you're in the Wild West is obviously a uh, good advice. Okay. Um... I have a, a, a question from um, Manuel uh, Castillo Duran, and um, Manuel asks, um, is there a reasonable disposition at the policy level to develop and implement the actions proposed kind of in this panel? You know, are the scenarios of change, will they be possible to any extent? So this is not necessarily a question of the economics, but I think it's it is a question if we were trying to mainstream or actually put this into use, like how what, how far are we, how reasonable or realistic is it? And, and I'll, I'll add on to this, which, which is, um, you know, Kathy, you talked about changing the framing. And it's like, so how can both the economic community and this integrated assessment community, how can we help in that and make it more likely that these things actually will lead to policy, better policy outcomes? An easy question for you all. I could answer, but I've been talking a bit already. Um, maybe I'll just briefly say something and see if it cues up any other responses. Is sort of the origin of the, some of the work in the in the two most recent reports were sort of they uh, came from this area, this question of how do we have uh, effect, and so. WWF was interested in this, uh, the World Bank was interested in this because of some of the very specific international convenings that were supposed to have happened already, but because of COVID haven't. Um, and uh, there, I'm not an expert on this, but there are many others um, that ha have thought, how can this type of report be used to inform those negotiations? Uh, last thing I'd say, and, and I think this was recorded so you could look at it, but our workshop within GlassNet uh, most recently that just finished, um, did invite a bunch of experts in this topic, policy experts, people who are trying to go to those meetings and have that sort of impact. Um, and I think they had some, some really good uh, thoughts on that. Um, I see, uh, and, but, and, and Tom also could comment on that. Um, but yeah, diving in, providing realistic results for those convenings is my, my thought. Yeah, I was just gonna chime in. I, the, the, my short answer is I don't know. <laughs> But uh, a slightly longer answer is I have seen incredible power of data. 
And I think that's the power of the GTAP GlassNet network and the World Bank work and, that, and the report that Justin just presented. Getting numbers out in front of people can make a huge impact on the conversation. If it's if it focuses the way people think, they then fight about the numbers, but that then also brings more um, engagement and focus on it. So in a sense, if this is, I, I think my, 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 my suggestion is just do it and they will come. And, and that's really what, again, this World Bank work it is the just having done it is, is phenomenal. I mean, that report is, and, and the glass that is what made it doable and GTAP the invest marriage. So I, I, I'm very optimistic having seen that that can be built and pushed and numbers, bad numbers, good numbers, all numbers have a huge impact. And those are good numbers. <laughs> you know, one, just to add one more thing to that. I think the policy process is unpredictable. And um, so you just keep plugging away, working in the trenches, get your numbers out there. As Kathy says, they're important. But that moment <laughs> when you have the reformable, you know, the reformable moment, Wall Street floods again, or something happens that really gets people's attention and um, they, um, they really focus in on this, having the numbers there at that point is important. So um, you don't know exactly when it's gonna happen. Well, I'll just say we're getting close to the end of time, but um, I, I will just say, I, I think actually we are at that moment. As, as Justin well knows, we've, we've been, and Tom, you too, we, we've been pretty much um, put the numbers out there and they will come. And we have been, it, it has been a moment where a lot of uh, interest has been generated and both in public sector, so government agencies, uh, agent, you know, international groups like the World, you know, international agencies like the World Bank, um, and also in the private sector increasingly. Um, and uh, so it, it is the moment, you know, given the scale of, of the problems that we're facing with climate change, and we've all seen the extreme weather uh, this summer, um, there is increasing interest in this area, obviously. And, uh, you know, it's, it's great work that uh, Tom, you and Justin and Kathy and many others in the community are doing to you know, show what the impacts of, of good decision versus poor decisions and how much difference that's gonna make both to people now, but um, you know, to, to future generations. So anyway, I, we're, we're at basically at the end of time, I'd just like to uh, thank Tom and Justin and Kathy for uh, their, their excellent presentations and, and insights. And uh, also to the, um, the audience here for, um, Excellent questions. Um, and uh, if we didn't get to your question and or you want to follow up, um, you know, there, there, uh, please please contact us at the at Natural Capital Project and we'd be happy to keep the dialogue going. So with that, um, thank you all again very much. I don't know, Mary, uh, if there's any else, anything else you want at the end, but uh, if not, um, I will say thanks and have a good rest of your day. Yep, thank you everybody.